Let me know when you're ready. Go ahead. Okay, hi everybody. Well, I'm Stephen Van Tassel as the uh, front page of our my PowerPoint says. So I'm the vertebrate pest specialist for the Montana Department of Agriculture. What does that mean to you? Well, I specialize in animals that have a spine. So uh, not necessarily an expert in insects or weeds, but uh, you know, I try to learn about those things as well because those are certainly pests to people. But my job really focuses on how do we deal with vertebrate animals? And so certainly house mice are a common vertebrate animal. I don't spend a lot of time on rats, and so I want to focus on house mice. Why? Because Montana really doesn't have a big issue with rats. That doesn't mean we don't have rats, because we do, but it's not a major issue. And typically, my, my understanding is, is that if you have rats, there are bigger, you got big problems. Uh, now, I'm not talking about the uh, pack rat, our bushy tail wood rat here. I'm talking about Norway rats. If you got a job with Norway rats, that's uh you probably have mice as well and so what i find is that people tend to not take mice seriously and i hope to convince you that that is something that you need to change an attitude whether it's for yourself or whether it's for clients if you're if you're dealing with uh, as a pest control operator so this is what i call the mickey mouse syndrome right so this is where we have disney uh, a company that i think has done a lot of damage to our culture in a variety of ways and this is certainly one of them uh, where we have tended to treat mice as cute and not a big deal and I, I mean i do think they're cute i mean in that sense but we tend not to take them seriously where people will move heaven and earth to get rid of rats with mice they're like oh it's just a mouse and i i want it today if nothing else if you don't listen to anything else i talk about today i hope i can convince you to take mice seriously um, without creating fear, without creating panic, without creating hysteria, but that you take mice seriously because they're doing more damage to your property than perhaps you realize. And so the question is ultimately, are you infected or not? And so I hope you're not. And if you are, maybe we can give you the cure today to get rid of that. So what are house mice doing? Well, like many, like many vertebrates, they cause damage in three different categories. I mean, disease vectors, that means a vector is an animal or an organism that brings the disease to you. Think of it like a school bus where the, the disease hops on board and the school bus brings that disease to you. That's called a vector. Well, house mice uh, and deer mice, in fact, I'm not really gonna be talking much about deer mice today, but uh, that's certainly another problem we have in Montana. But in terms of house mice, they can vector diseases to us. Now, I'm not going to overplay the disease issue. I mean, if diseases from mice were as big of a deal as sometimes they're portrayed out to be, we'd we would uh, have a lot more illness. Now, that doesn't mean there is no problem with it. We just don't want to hype it. And I'm not one to hype the disease issue per se, but it is there and it is something to consider. They also damage infrastructure. Now, that is something I think that we don't take seriously enough. And I'll give you some evidence regarding that. And I hope that is a motivation in and of itself to eliminate mice. Then, of course, the damage they do to stored agricultural production, sort of grain bins and that sort of thing. We're not going to focus a lot about that today because the reality is, is if you deal with structural mice and to deal with it properly you're going to be able to eliminate some of these other issues as well okay so certainly always never hesitate to give me a call drop me an email as i tell people i am the most available government worker you know and so if you can't get a hold of me it's because you didn't leave a, vo a voicemail message a lot of people are shy for some reason they don't like to leave a message on my answering machine or they didn't uh, call the right place or they didn't send me an email so if you can't get a hold of me uh, i'm dead so that's not going to be able to get a hold of me then that way all right so i love hearing from you why because your feedback helps me provide training that's going to be suitable for you and others and so i love that kind of dialogue to help us walk through challenges that you may be having in the field so uh, as I said before, mice are vectors of various diseases, and I certainly don't want to underplay it, but I don't want to overplay it as well. So let's talk about salmonella. You may have heard of salmonella. It's a food poisoning issue. So it can 
last on on mouse feces for up to 86 days and then you have another bacterial infection known as campylobacter which also causes that gastrointestinal issue where your stomach feels poorly so we don't want mice in our kitchens i mean let's be honest we don't want them peeing and defecating on our food we don't want them walking on our surfaces because sometimes it's not so much the mouse itself that's the problem although it can be but the fact that the mouse is walking through all these dirty areas and then all that materials on his fur, it's on his feet, and then he's carrying it with him onto surfaces that we want to try to keep clean. And then he's peeing and pooping all the way as well. So they also have uh, bacteria that that can be with them as well. They could be a disease reservoir where it doesn't harm them, but they're able to transmit it. Uh, C. diff, and those of you in the medical community will certainly be familiar with C. diff. That's a very serious uh, infection. Staph, staph infection, of course, is also very serious. And then finally, one, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find out from the state whether we have this particular disease in Montana yet, or at least we have proof of it yet. It certainly occurs elsewhere. It's an underdiagnosed disease associated with uh, with mice. And it's called lymphocytic chorio-meningitis. That's a or LCM for short. And unfortunately, I'm not going to talk a lot more about that because I don't know if it occurs here yet. I haven't got feedback yet from the Department of Public Health. So, but stay tuned. If you happen to travel to other states, it certainly occurs elsewhere. I just haven't found evidence of it occurring here in Montana yet so the point is, is you want to be careful so make sure you're washing your hands how about something that you may not have thought about other than disease there is an association of rodents with allergies and so allergies isn't so much an infection it's it's an allergic response where your body has treated a particular protein as dangerous and then your body overreacts to that protein that's what an allergy ultimately is and what what the research shows is that constant exposure to rodent protein that's through urine that's through dander that's like through hair through through their feces and that constant exposure you can develop an allergy over time and what they found was that people who were doing you know dealing with lab rats and lab mice that after five years of experience with that that most of them would contract this or develop these allergies and so if you're dealing with mice on a regular basis as a professional you have to understand this is one of the hazards of our job and that is i mean i suspect part of my allergy condition is because of my work with wildlife in my younger in my younger years and so i'm not telling you to be afraid of it what i'm telling you is that when we talk about the importance of putting on your ppe the importance of washing your hands the importance of recognizing that our work with wildlife can be potentially hazardous to us that that is just a reality, just like every job has a hazard to it. Well, this is one of the hazards with us. And so what they're finding is that inner city children who are exposed a lot of times to mice, dander, that they're developing allergies as well. And of course, us as professionals, and you don't want mice inside of your house. So or structures that you're spending long periods of time and you need to eliminate them. So how about ectoparasites? Not really an issue so much in terms of Montana. Part of the reason I suspect is we're just too dry and too cold. However, if you have a client who says, you know, I've had mice and then you've kind of gotten, maybe you've gotten rid of some of those mice and they're starting to feel the creepy crawlies on them, don't just assume that it's all in their head. It may be in their head, but it may be a result that the parasites are been falling off the mice and now they're looking for a new host and they're coming on to the human. So don't just simply assume that the person's crazy, as they say, uh, it may be real. And of course, mice can also be exposing us to things like fleas and of course, ticks as they're encountering structures as well. So again, not a big issue. I have not heard of it being a big issue here in Montana, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind because uh, if as a professional or someone who may be working with mice, it's something definitely to keep in the back of your mind because you might find that outlier in terms of your work. So here's what I really want to focus on today and that the structural damage that mice do to your house or to your client's house is very serious. Now the upper right hand photo that you have there, that occurred within six months. So what happens is think about it year after year after year, mice are getting into structures. So they are working their way through insulation and they're peeing on it, they're pooping on it. And I'm not talking about disease at this particular point. What I'm talking about is the degradation 
of the fluffiness of that insulation and the consistency of it. Insulation works on the basis of its ability to trap air. So as that's being depressed by movement of rodents through it, by being by being tunneled through and peed on and defecated on, that insulation loses its loft and therefore loses its R value. And so this is why buildings that are older are losing some of their insulation. It's not just because of bad construction, but mice have gotten in there and kind of chewed their way up. And so this is constant year after year. This is why I encourage people to take mice seriously. And then of course, mice get into vehicles, they get into campers, they get into outbuildings. This picture in the lower right is my car. Yes, believe it or not, I've had problems with rodents getting into my vehicle. This is certainly one. Uh, you want to make sure you're dealing with that. And there is a relationships. There is some theory out there that says that the soy, when, when manufacturers were beginning to use green insulation around the wires, that the soy was more attractive to rodents than the petroleum insulation. And so there was a lawsuit against the Toyota company about that. I don't know how that lawsuit played out, but there was certainly some anecdotal evidence that that was more, uh, more of a problem with the soy, but understand that mites may be more attracted to the soy insulation, but they'll chew the rubber stuff as well. So those are some things to be thinking about. We don't want rodents around our structures and around our vehicles. So we really need to take that seriously. All right, let's transition over into a little bit of biology. I'm not gonna spend a lot on it because you can Google some of those things, but understand how little a mouse needs to live. I try to explain to people to understand that when we're talking about a Cheerio, if a Cheerio drops on the floor, that's like giving a Thanksgiving dinner to a mouse. So when we're dealing with mice, we really need to work on sanitation and cleanliness to the extent possible. Now, sometimes that's overwhelming for people that have livestock or chickens and you know animals around the house. If you're feeding your dog outside, you are providing sources of food for mice. That's a problem. Now, that you may not be able to overcome that completely, but every little thing you can do to limit the amount of food available to mice, you are helping put stress on that population. Bird feeders are one of my best friends when I was in business. When people had unmodified bird feeders, that was just money in the bank. It doesn't matter how far away the bird feeder is from the house. It just means it takes longer for the mice to get there. So well-fed mice are reproductive and fertile mice, and they have more young, and they have more young coming to maturity. So it's a major, major issue. But look at how little they need to eat. So we really need to focus on the little things and cleanliness and making sure that food is not available to mice. Reproduction, we need to take this seriously. This is one of the problems with, with mouse control is that people don't take their reproductive rate seriously. They're trying to trap some mice and they're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm having some success with mice. The question is, are you eliminating the population or are you harvesting the population? We don't want harvesting, we want elimination of the population and that takes a little bit more work. And so understand you have a male and a female, they mate the female. These are, by the way, these are all conservative numbers here. I'm not using the higher end numbers, I'm using the lower end numbers, okay? So within 21 days, she gives birth to five young. They tend to have 50-50 parity, and I've assumed that in this case, there's only two females. Because remember, with mouse control, everything balances on the female. So in 56 days, those young are now mature enough to mate. Only takes one male to mate the females. Now in 21 days later, they have young. And so you can see how in the space of 75 days, you can have three generations of mice. So, and you can see how this can spiral over time. So it's important to understand that if you just trap a bunch of mice and think you're getting it done without getting that last pair, you're just gonna have a rebound in about 75 days. So if you're getting callbacks on your job in you know, a couple of months, 
it meant you probably missed something or you had new reinvasion into that particular structure. So what is the home range of a house mouse? And again, this all varies. These are rules of thumb. They're not gospel. They're rules of thumb to help you as a technician or as a homeowner trying to deal with rodents here. And house mouse typically have a home range of about 30 feet as a rule of thumb. Now, if they have access to food in a closer area, then their home range will shrink to 10 feet maybe. It can be significantly smaller. It depends on how far that mouse has to go to get access to food. They don't want to be very far away from their food source, but if they have to be, they will travel for it. So remember, it's always three dimensional. So you got to look up, you got to look across, and you have to look down. So how many mice can live in this particular two floor house? And it can be surprising because you can have a a mouse nest here, you can have a mouse nest there, and a mouse nest there. So if you're trapping mice maybe in the garage and you're thinking, man, I'm really hammering their these mice, and have you gotten the other two families of mice in that house? So this is a problem. And so we need to be sure that just because you're catching mice, are you catching all the mice and are you catching the right mice? The right mice. Understand their physical capabilities. And this is something I think we don't fully appreciate. We don't appreciate the reproductive rate. We don't appreciate how, uh, how little they need to eat. And we also don't appreciate just how amazing these creatures are. So let's take a look at this. A mouse can climb any rough surface. Brick, they will go up a brick house and just climb right up the wall. Not a problem for a mouse, not a big deal. But what I want you to focus on is the standing vertical jump. Now, if you can see me having my little hands up here, think of it as a standing vertical jump. This was research done out of Hawaii, and the researcher was basically training mice to see how the weakest, smallest mice, how high could that mouse jump. And so what he did was he had, they were on the surface here, and then he kept raising the platform to see how high they could jump on to get the food up on the set. So this is a vertical jump, not a running jump. This is just standing vertical jump. The weakest mouse could do almost 10 inches. So if you're ever in the kitchen and you're wondering, well, how did these mouse droppings get onto the, onto the cabinets? Well, the mouse might have climbed there, but the mouse may have just simply jumped from the countertop right onto the shelf. Now think about it, if this is the weakest mouse, what does the Michael Jordan mouse do? How high can he jump? So that's what you wanna think about. Think about how they're able to do a running jump, 24 inches, that's amazing. And then of course they can do what's called a jump down. How far can they jump from a surface to the floor? They can go eight feet without injuring themselves. I mean, they're simply amazing creatures. So when we're talking about inspection, make sure we're talk about always be safe in your inspection. So here I have a picture of what not to do and what's better to do, but it's not perfect. So don't do as I do, do as I say, right? So don't do this, don't stick your head above a drop ceiling. And if you're dealing with mice and you're not looking above the drop ceiling, you are not doing mouse control. Okay, so let's make that clear. But you never want to do this because you don't know what's above that drop ceiling. There could be a pile of feces on top of that from another animal that you're not familiar with. So always make sure you're protecting yourself. So at minimum, I would say you need to have a respirator on, needs to be properly fitted, and you need to have it, you need to be sure that it's at least half face mask. I recommend a full face mask. And those of you with beards, that's not going to work. So you're going to make sure you need to have a proper respiratory protection. Because remember, in Montana, we also have deer mice and deer mouse droppings. You disturb that, and they're fresh enough, you could expose yourself to the disease known as hantavirus. But here's an example. Where are the gloves? It's not for an odor issue. Gloves are to help protect you from the diseases that an animal can carry with you. So always make sure you're protecting yourself. So when we're looking for sign of rodents, and we want to make, take a look at what kind of, we may see gnawing damage. And so how do we separate a mouse gnaw from a rat gnaw? Well, you're going to have a ruler you're carrying a ruler with you when you're doing your inspections for pest control, right? And well, I certainly hope you are. Well, you're going to need that because you need to measure the distance between, between those gnawings. And so if you're looking at three to four millimeters, 
that's a rat. If you're looking at something smaller than that, that's going to be a mouse. And here we have an example of some acorns in the right hand corner, the right hand photo. Notice how the mouse has nibbled at it from the edge. And the reason is because a mouse doesn't have the jaw power of a rat or a squirrel. So a rat will just simply take an acorn and just cut it in half. No big deal. A mouse can't do that. He has to gnaw at that edge to get the, the meat out of the seed. And so that's going to be a classic sign of mouse presence if you happen to come across that. What about mouse nests? Well, again, this is my house back in Lincoln, Nebraska. And notice we have this large amount of uh, plant material where the mouse nest was. And here we have another mouse nest. This wasn't in my house, thank goodness, but the left one was where the mouse was simply crawling a wire that was going up to the roof, the roof area. And there was also a climbing ivy. And he just climbed right up there and found a gap and made a made a nest up there. Look at how much time it would have taken him bringing all those grass and leaves up there to create this massive nest. That's a lot of time that they put into it. Why? Because mice need to do that because they have a, a high ratio of surface area to body mass. So that means they lose a lot of body heat. They need those large globular nests in order to keep themselves warm. And we'll get back to that a little bit more because heat is a key indicator of where you want to do your inspections. But here we have a mouse making a nest inside of a drawer inside of an abandoned building. So that's going to be classic. You want to be careful with those materials. Why? Because they defecate inside their nests. You may have maybe exposed to some mouse droppings and expose yourself to hantavirus. You want to be careful when you're handling this, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. If we're doing inspections inside of attic, of course, you're going to be having your respirator. You're going to be wearing your gloves. You may want to be thinking about a Tyvek suit, depending on your situation. Certainly, if you're working in, in areas that you're not familiar with, and I'm going to encourage you to wear a Tyvek suit. But here we have blown own in insulation on someone's roof, um, excuse me, in someone's attic, and we are looking at it from above, staring down. And notice it looks like a ping pong ball has been rolled through the insulation. Well, that's not a ping pong ball going through. That's mouse, mice runs cruising away through that insulation. Notice how they're packing that down, lowering the R value, and we can see sign of rodents. And of course, you'll see droppings inside of those trails as well. Here we have an indicator of where someone used some uh, expanding foam to block an opening and the mouse just simply chewed right through it. Again, that was my house here on the left, okay? So why am I telling you this? Because I don't want you to think that it's a holier than thou situation, that, I, that mice don't affect my life at all. They do because mice are everywhere. Wherever humans are, mice are. And so it's not a question of if you're gonna have mice, it's a question of when you're gonna have mice. So we, we need to prepare and we need to make sure we harden our houses and make sure we respond quickly when mice have an invasion into our structures. So how do we differentiate between mouse droppings and bat droppings? Well, mouse droppings tend to be scattered. When a mouse is cruising around your property, he's just defecating wherever he's at. Typically, the defecations will be behind structures on the floor. On the floor, they'll be along wall edges. They'll be on top of insulation. They may be below insulation. Bat droppings tend to be piled and concentrated. Why? Because bats tend to defecate where they're hanging, or where we call roosting, or when they exit and enter a building. The droppings will tend to be there. Another sign is if you can take a little pencil or a pen and tap the dropping, and the dropping crumbles, that's going to be a bat dropping. If the dropping is hard, that's going to be a mouse dropping. And then if you have a magnifying glass or have good in or good have good vision, you're going to see little what I call fairy dust inside of the bat dropping. What that is is the exoskeletons of the of the insects that the bats have been eating, where mice are going to be just pure black all the way through. So those are going to be some signs. You should be able to interview your client right over the phone to distinguish between whether you have mouse droppings or whether you have bat droppings. And remember, a home can have both. You can have bats in your house and have mice in your house. It's not a question of either or. You can have a both, a both and. So when we talk about integrated pest management, we want to be, if we're literally looking to control mice rather than just harvesting mice, we have to do these three things. We have to have the habitat modification coupled with, with competent control measures and then have a monitoring program so that we're paying attention to when the mice 
are returning or rebounding or whether we have finished the job or not. So it's it's this constant cycle that we're always through because the war with mice never ends. If you think your war with mice has ended, you have been fooled. And let me just sort of lay that out for you. The war with mice never ends. And I know everyone thinks their cat is the greatest mouser. Not true. Okay, we'll talk about cats here a little bit later, a little bit later as well. So let's talk about timing. Rodents in Montana tend to try to enter structures when the temperature gets colder. That means they've already tried to enter your house probably several weeks ago. The cold snap we had, they're moving, they want to find, they're getting ready for winter, they're already looking for a house. Another trigger, of course, is harvesting because you have mice out in the field and you're harvesting. Well, those mice now have lost the habitat that they've had. They've lost the food source that they had access to. Now they need to find something else. In some parts of the country, when I was teaching down in Kansas, they were telling me that during times of high summer heat, they were having mice enter structures simply to try to find a place that was cool. Now, that may happen here in Montana. I have not been familiar with that. Is If you've had experience with that, certainly I would love to hear about it. We want to, so now let's turn to how do we control mice? Well, step one, we remove their harborage. We remove the places where they live. We remove the conditions that make them feel comfortable. Here's the rule of thumb that I give people. If you build it, they will come. If you remove it, they will go. That's basically as simple as it gets. Why are mice inside of your house? Well, because they can get in and it's conducive for them to live there. We want to make that as hard as possible for them not to feel comfortable inside of our structures. So when we have areas around our house that allow mice to live, that's structure because mice want to hide because everything wants to eat a mouse. So when we give them structure, when we allow the grass near our house go to seed, that is simply a food source for mice. That's going to cause the population to expand, and when the population expands, they need to expand their territory and find new places to live, and that means your house. It's, a, it's really that simple. You want to make sure you're cleaning that all up. You want to make sure you're hardening your structure in the sense that it's making it difficult for them to get to it. You want to establish a weed-free perimeter. If you have outbuildings and you have weeds growing up against those outbuildings, that's just encouraging mice to get there because now they have cover to get to the get to the structure and they may be able to be fed on the way there. You want to have these weed free perimeters to make it difficult because mice don't want to travel across exposed areas. Now, can they? Absolutely they can, but we're trying to make it difficult the same way the reason why you lock your doors to your house, will it stop a burglar? No, it slows them down. And every time you make a barrier for a burglar, it makes it less likely they're going to rob your house and more likely they're going to rob someone else's. Same way when it comes to rodents. Every time we make, we ratchet up a little bit of the pain for them, it makes other control methods more effective. That's why we want to think of it as a comprehensive approach to controlling rodents. Here are these structures. We have tree branches overhanging the roof because mice can climb trees access the roof. Don't just think that mice come to into your structure at ground level. They will, but they'll come in at roof level as well. So don't be deceived by that. And then here we have another structure on the lower right hand corner that has climbing ivy. I call that the individual wanted to make it easier for the mice to access it. So he gave them basically a scaffolding to climb into the building. So you want to make sure if you have that or you have a client with that, understand that that's going to be a weakness for that particular structure. I mentioned earlier the importance of modifying bird feeders. Like I said, when I was in business and wildlife control back in Massachusetts, bird feeders were my best friend because they were guaranteed money for my wallet. Why? Because where there is food, there will be a supply to eat it. Now, I'm not telling people to get rid of their bird feeders. A lot of times, these are very important for people. They're part of the they're part of the way they they get pleasure out of life. And so, I'm not saying that bird feeders are automatically wrong. What I'm saying is, unmodified bird feeders are bad. We want bird feeders that are good. 
We want bird feeders that are modified appropriately so that they're not feeding animals we don't want. And mice are certainly one of them. Here we have two examples of modified bird feeders where squirrels can't get onto the one on the left, and we have one where it's capturing bird seed before it reaches the ground. Both of those are very positive forms of bird feeding modifications. There are a lot more issues. My publication that I wrote when I was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln is available online. There's no additional charge for it. It's just if you have an internet connection, download it. It can give you some very easy to implement strategies. If you have more complicated uh, strategies, you can add if you want to really ratchet it up. But I encourage people do at least the basic elements, and some of them are very easy to do, and they will save you money, which is even better. So. Download this publication. It's very easy to find. Just put in a Google search, Van Taps Bird Feeding, and you will get the publication. And of course, if you have additional questions, don't hesitate to reach out and contact me. Don't avoid doing this. It's important. All right, so how do we harden the structure now? We talked about making the conditions less conducive to mice on the outside of the structure. Now we want to prevent them from getting through the door. And that means we have to seal up gaps and cracks quarter inch or larger. And we need to do that appropriately. So that means you need to have a good inspection of the structure looking for these gaps and entries into it. And that is from the peak of the building all the way down to the ground. Yes, the entire structure. That means you may have to do some ladder work. Now, if you're not, if you don't feel safe on ladders, don't get on a ladder, okay? Because you can fall and really hurt yourself. But the point is, is just because you can't do the entire house doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. I tell people all the time, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Just because you can't fill the hole at the rooftop, roof line, doesn't mean you shouldn't take care of the, the hole on the foundation. Do what you can, every little bit helps, making your house less likely to have a mouse invasion. Okay, so do something. How do you do that? Well, you look for these gaps. Here we have a situation where a brick house, if you're looking carefully, if you're just looking at the foundation level, you're gonna miss this. This is up along the roof line. Notice how a mouse can simply climb the brick and then find the gap along the mortar joint and slip right underneath that sill right up into the attic, and there you go, squeeze right in. Again, we're looking at something a little more than a quarter of an inch gap. Any place where you can take a pencil or a pen and stick that into the gap, that's a mouse can get in there relatively quickly. P gaps around pipes are notorious for this. You need to be sure you're hardening those up and hardening them up appropriately. And you need to use the proper tools. Here you wanna use a nice silicone-based uh, sealant, and use that to fill these particular gaps. Why silicone? Because silicone will flex. Your building moves and, and adjusts over time. And if you use something that's too firm, it's going to crack and it's going to leave a gap down the road. You want to use quality silicones because your labor cost is really the most important cost. Talk to your hardware store. Don't get the cheap stuff. Get something that's going to last you a while because you want something that's going to last over time. Don't use foam unless you are securing that foam with something solid over it, whether it be aluminum flashing, whether it be wood, because foam breaks down under UV radiation and it can be gnawed through. So if you have a large gap and a large space that needs to be filled, use the foam, but be sure you're covering the opening to that with something solid, otherwise the mice are just simply gonna chew right through it. So how do you want to close these holes? Well, you want to use a product known as excluder fabric. This is a stainless steel impregnated plastic fiber that allows you to be, it allows it to be cut with, with a special shears and then you use gloves and you can use a screwdriver and, and just wedge that into various openings because animals don't want to chew their way through stainless steel shards. So it's not going to rust. Notice I haven't said anything about steel wool. Why steel wool rusts? Don't use steel wool. You can use something known as copper stuff it. Now, copper stuff it can be gnawed, but typically it's too densely packed to make it easy for animals to chew through. And then, of course, you're going to caulk this uh, as a final sealant to stop that airflow. If you're dealing with ridge vents, there's a product out there known as Ridge Guard, and there are some various knockoffs of Ridge Guard 
that do the same thing. See, in years past, you had to remove the entire ridge vent, put the screen down, and then attach, reattach the ridge vent. Well, those days are long gone. This particular product has been gold for the wildlife control industry, and you can seal off ridge vents now in provide a permanent long-term solution to prevent rodents and other animals from access accessing roofs through the ridge vents and allow them to still have airflow but keep the animals out it has been a revolution to the industry definitely check it out so let's give me give you a video about how to use this excluder fabric to fill a particular gap so let's take a moment and we'll watch this All right, was that easy enough? I hope that made it clear that it's really not that hard to do this sort of thing. So I hope that you encourages you to do that again. Don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Do something to reduce the amount of to, to reduce the ease of access into your structure. So let's give you a little bit of data about why it's so important to do the habitat modification. Sometimes when we're dealing with vertebrates, People just want to get to killing them and, you know, killing them is important. Don't get me wrong, but you have to be thinking broader than that because you have to reduce the conditions that allow those rodents to be there in the first place. Notice the left hand diagram shows you what happens with lethal control. Typically what happens in lethal control, we knock the population down. We get it down low. We think, hey, we're done. We have Shangri-La, but we didn't get the last few. And then we have a rebound. Well, then you just start harvesting. Well, if we do habitat modification, just this, the diagram on the right is just habit, habitat modification alone. Notice what happens to the population over time. Because remember, when a mouse doesn't have access to food, doesn't have access to shelter, it's going to die. So now if you do those two things and add the lethal control, it's a one-two punch that really, that really hammers them. Don't ignore your habitat modification. So let's talk about some other control methods as we're starting to transition more in the lethal side of things. How about the frightening devices? Well, let me kind of sum it up for you. Good luck. So can you try these things? Absolutely, you know, if it, because uh, one of the things I get discouraged about in terms of my job is everyone thinks I lie for a living. Why? Because they think I'm holding back the good information. They think, well, you know, he's a government worker. He wants to keep his job. So he wants to make sure that we have a little bit of success, but not the real success that we need to have. Uh, okay, so I just stop arguing with people. I'm not convinced that any of these products are that work, and there's evidence for some of them that they don't work. So try it out for yourself. See what happens. Uh, you know, the point is that people are going to do that anyways. Uh, just simply say, uh, buyer beware. Make sure that you're looking through things. There's, uh, you know, it's just the way it is. I'm not going to talk a lot more about this. I can, I'm certainly willing if there's scientific evidence to suggest that these things work. A lot of times the products that do work are not used appropriately and sometimes they're oversold and underused. You know, so there's a lot of variables when we're dealing with frightening and frightening devices and repellents. So uh, not a big fan, but I'm happy to find evidence that suggests otherwise. And if you want to call me, we can certainly talk about some of these products that may have a role in your particular situation. How about mothballs? A lot of people like to throw mothballs around. They'll throw them inside of their RVs and that sort of thing. Be careful with mothballs. I mean, other than the legalities of doing that sort of thing, because remember, mothballs are, are a pesticide. They're, they're supposed to be controlling insects. 
they're not supposed to be controlling rodents, right? So people are off labeling that. That's, that's scary in and of itself. But I want you to understand that there's health effects by breathing these vapors, right? So naphthalene, mothballs come in two different styles. You have the naphthalene kind and the paradiochlorobenzene. Whenever you hear that word benzene, that should make you a little nervous. This is something that's not nice to have around. Okay, so there are some health risks involved with these particular products. Be careful. I'm just telling you, don't use them. Now, are they noxious to mice? Yes, yes, they are. But often the concentrations you need to have to drive them out of structures, it's going to drive you out long before it drives the mouse out. Believe me or not, beware because remember, you're using it off label, so all the liability is on you. So let's talk about trapping. Be safe with traps. Why do I tell you to wear gloves? It's not about odor, it's about safety. Okay, the mice, house mouse in your house isn't worried about your smell. If he was, he wouldn't be there, right? So it's not about odor, it's about you being safe because animals are dirty, you don't know where that animal's been. Make sure you're protecting yourself and make sure you have a regimen to check your traps. Glue boards, a lot of people like to use glue boards. This is certainly a problem among professionals. They kind of toss them out. They think they're quick. They think they're grabbing all of the quote unquote parasites off of the rodents. The fact is glue boards are not that effective in the control of rodents. Do they catch rodents? Yes, but which rodents do they catch? They catch the juveniles. Why? Because the juveniles have shorter whiskers. These vibrissa are basically extensions of their nerve endings. And when they're running along, scurrying along, that's they're often too short to identify the presence of the glue board. That causes them to get caught. The adults, however, have longer vibrissa and they will see the glue board. And once they encounter a glue board and get one of those vibrissa pulled out of their whisker, out of their cheeks, they're never touching another glue board again. And they'll just jump right over it. And then all of a sudden, so people think because they're catching some, some mice with these glue boards, they're thinking, oh, they're so effective. They're, they're not. I'm not wanting them to be banned, but if this is your first line of attack for rodents, you're doing it wrong. Okay, let me just say that right out, right off the bat. So definitely keep that in mind. What types of devices should you be using? If you're using traps, you want to be using snapback traps. Expanded trigger traps are absolutely critical. You should be thinking about multiple catch traps. I like multiple catch traps to be placed on the exterior of a building. One, at least one for each wall. More is better. Traps are like money. More is better if you buy more. So you want to make sure you're getting enough and using them appropriately. Here's a product that's out there that may, some of you may not have been familiar with. This is called the A24 Good Nature Trap. Now let's check this thing out. This is a CO2 fired repeating trap. What happens is the mouse, if there's a bait canister at the top, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but at the top round part here, that's a bait canister. The mouse sticks his head up into this hole and then a captive bolt comes across and pierces his skull. And then the rodent drops out, like you see in the picture on the lower right. Here we have a deer mouse that got whacked by this A24. It's an amazing. Now, don't stick your finger up there because it will put a hole through your finger. And that's really going to hurt. So you want to be careful where you're using this device. You know what? If you have pets, if you have children, you want to be careful. So I would encourage this to be used inside of a structure or a place that you have good control over. But it's the beauty of it is it's toxic and free. And it's a repeating trap. It is a bit pricey, though. Certainly something you may want to check out for if you want to reduce your pesticide use. Now, in terms of using, improving your trap success, you want to use an expanded trigger. Why? Expanded triggers are more effective in the control of mice. It also allows you the ability to use them in a blind set. A blind set is when you're using the trap without bait. Yes, because you can put this trap up perpendicular to a wall and the mouse can just simply step on the expanded trigger and get caught with no bait whatsoever. So you can catch mice without bait with your expanded trigger. Always make sure from time to time you add some fresh traps to your batch. Why? There's some research that suggests when you capture a dominant male, females are sometimes avoiding traps that have been caught that have caught dominant males. So 
We want to catch the females. Sorry, guys, catching when we're dealing with rodents, it's all about the females. So we want to make sure we're catching those as well. Setting technique, we want to make sure we're setting our traps appropriately. Notice how it's perpendicular to the wall with the narrow end against the wall. If you need to let set them horizontal, uh, parallel to the wall, make sure you put two traps, one in each direction, because you don't know which side the mouse is going to come to. You want to give that mouse full access to the to the trigger so that he can be hit with the striker bar. Where do you place your traps? Location, location, location is dominant. You have to focus everything on that. You want to be placing your traps in areas where you're seeing uh, scat, where you're seeing where they're out of the way, where you see food sources, if you see rub marks, if you've ever seen a mouse in that particular area. And then most importantly, you want to be thinking about heat. Look at those areas where there's a constant heat source, and that's where you want to do it. Here's the bottom line. If you are setting your traps or putting your bait stations in areas where you're not getting down on your hands and knees and making it hard on yourself, you are not doing it correctly. So why do we want to look for heat? Because rodents need heat in order to keep them, keep their, uh, reduce the amount of food they need to eat. Because remember I talked about that body the body surface to size ratio, it's too high for mice. And so therefore they're losing a lot of heat through their body and they will wanna find sources of constant heat. That's where you wanna spend your time first when you're looking for sign. When we're setting our traps, we wanna pre-bait first. We don't wanna just simply place traps around and then bait them and bait them and set them immediately. We wanna bait our traps place them and not set them. Why do we want to encourage mice to encounter these particular traps? When we're getting good activity, then we set them all at once because we want to avoid educating our mice. Mice, when they're seeing a friend that's been dead in one of the other bodies, it may encourage them to avoid that device in the future. We don't want to cause that. Check your catch. You need to have 50-50 parallel balance when we're catching our rodents. If we're not catching the same, about the same number of females as males, that's a problem. Now, if we're catching more females than males, then who cares? That's all right. But if you're only, if you're catching more males than females beyond 10% ratio, that's a problem and you need to make sure you're fixing that. We also need to check the size of our mice. Our mice, once you get to about six inches, tip of the tail to the tip of the nose, that's an adult mouse. So if you're catching smaller mice, that's great. It means you're getting closer to the nest. Keep working at it so you can get that nest and eliminate out that whole that whole particular family. All right, let's take the last few minutes to talk about toxicants. I mean, the label is the law. You probably heard that to ad nauseum, but just remember that here are all the various rodenticides legal in Montana for the control of mice. Now I've added one for rats only that's contrapest and I've added one that may be coming on the market down the road called EpiBlock. Both of those particular products are basically reproductive technologies that inhibit the reproduction of rodents. Now, Contrapest is only labeled for rats, which is beyond the scope of our presentation today, but EpiBlock is not, is not registered right now, but it was in the past, and I suspect with California's decision to ban second-generation anticoagulants, we might see this come back. If you have $2 million burning a hole in your pocket, this company is for sale. So uh, definitely something to think about. What I want you to focus on here is I want you to be thinking about using first generation anticoagulants. A lot of times we focus on second gens. We shouldn't. We want to be thinking about first generations because they're safer. Let me give an illustration of what I mean here. A lot of times people think, well, these the first generations aren't as effective. Understand that when we deal with LD50, LD50 is based on a, an acute dose. How much does a mouse need to eat at one feeding to get a toxic dose 50% of the time? Well, notice in this particular product, difacinone, which is a first generation anticoagulant, takes 30 milligrams per kilogram to kill a to kill a mouse, that's the LD50. Now look what happens if the mouse is eating a little bit over time. If we get a little bit on day one and a little bit on day two, you get the idea by day five, he gets a total of 7.05 milligrams. But the LD50 for a mouse on over time is only 1.4 milligrams. So what happens is you say, Stephen, that doesn't make any sense. How did it take so much less to kill the mouse over five days than it did all at once? 
Well, because anticoagulants are more toxic over time. When you get a little bit each day, they actually work better. So don't think that first generation anticoagulant rodenticides aren't effective. It just means you got to make sure that bait doesn't run out. Okay. So why is this important? Secondary poisoning issues are becoming an issue. Now, I know we don't talk about that much here in Montana, but it is becoming an issue. So when you're putting out all these rodenticides on the landscape, when you're putting them, putting them in bait stations outside of your house and other animals can get access to that, or they're eating the, the rodents that are getting fed that toxicant, that can cause secondary poisoning. First generation anticoagulants are safer they're not safe, they're safer than second gens. And so I'm encouraging you to be thinking about going to first generation anticoagulants. So what are the ways to reduce risk to non-target animals? Remove that cover, do the habitat modification, secure the structure, trap before you poison. And then when you do, do it, use your poison as a final cleanup, make sure you're putting the toxicant inside the structure in your bait stations, away from outside animals, away from children, make sure these are locked up and using proper bait stations, keeping your pets away, of course, and then try to use first generation anticoagulants before you turn over to second generation anticoagulants. Mouse bait stations, we wanna modify our rat size bait stations. And the way to do that here is here I have a mason jar. I just cut a one inch hole in it, place the mason jar inside of the rat size bait station. Why is it important? Because now you have a larger animal get into the rat station, but he still can't get into the bait station because there's only a one inch hole. If you're only dealing with mice, do something to narrow the opening of that rat size bait station. You only need a one inch opening if you're dealing with mice. Let's try to avoid non-target animals getting into this toxicant so that we reduce the risk of secondary poisoning. You can also get what's called just mouse stations. Protecta is a type one bait station. It is allowed for outdoor use. I just want you to be careful if you have free ranging dogs, if you have raccoons, it's probably not gonna hold up against those things. And for some of you, you're in areas where you probably need to use a steel bait station to keep animals out of it or to keep cattle from crushing them. So definitely think about what type of exposure those bait stations have. Toxic bait tips. If you're using bait stations around the structure, use one color inside the house and another color outside the house. Why does that matter? So when you're finding droppings, you can ask yourself the question, where did, where did the mouse feed? So if you're seeing the color on the outside of the house on the inside of the house, it meant that mean the rodent went outside, ate that bait, came inside, you get to find that gap. And of course, vice versa. It helps you to sort of evaluate what type of activity you're having with your rodents. Make sure you're protecting yourself Wear your gloves, wear your PPE, make sure you're washing your hands after you're doing your work and before you're using the restroom. Animals are dirty, definitely think about that. Now let's talk lastly about some hantavirus here. I haven't really focused on deer mice here in this presentation. We do have deer mice in Montana. Understand we also have white-footed mouse in Montana, particularly in the eastern half of the state. These animals carry hantavirus. We haven't seen any indication of house mice carrying hantavirus, but remember, you're not going to be able to tell the difference by the rodent by the rodent dropping. So if you're seeing a rodent dropping, assume it's a house to assume it's a deer mouse and treat it accordingly. This is what happens to you when you contract hantavirus. It basically causes a massive pneumonia inside of your lungs, and the death rate actually is higher than 33% here. It's actually closer to 38%. That's with modern medicine, if you can imagine that. How, when do the symptoms come in? Typically, they come in within five to six weeks, but it can take up to 62 weeks to get symptoms with this. Did you remember what you did 62 weeks ago? This is why it's important to be careful with this. This is the hantavirus cases we've We've had in Montana, we've had 10 fatalities. This is between 1993 and 2017. This is sort of the latest data that I could get a hold of here. It is here in Montana. So don't think I'm just trying to scare you with a with a hyper scare you. I just want you to be cautious with this particular 
with this particular disease because it has affected people within Montana. How do we protect ourselves? If you're going into a cabin that hasn't been used in a long time, you should air it out before you start walking around in there. At least a half an hour. You want to spray droppings with a disinfectant to their wet and soaked before you begin wiping them up. Never, ever, ever vacuum up droppings. You want to you want to wet mop those droppings with a disinfectant while you're wearing your respirator. All right, and you're wearing your gloves. That's something you want to learn about. There's more information from the CDC if you want to get that. Thankfully, the virus is very easy to kill. It's very quick, very easy to kill this virus. Just be careful with it. I would also encourage you, if you're doing wildlife control, vertebrate control for any length of time, carry one of these cards. Educate your medical doctor about some of the diseases that you can be exposed with because you're doing vertebrate control. This is something you can download online. Cats, they're not as effective as you think they are. Okay, I know everyone's cat special. It's supposed to be the, the queen of killing all rodents in the universe. I get it. I know, I know, but they're really not. Okay, that, that's the research is telling us this. Plus, cats can carry a a parasite that can affect you as well. Toxoplasmosis, look it up online. Tell me why you're not scared of this particular infection. I would love to hear from you. By the way, my phone hasn't rung yet about this particular fungus disease yet. Whether people are still in denial, I don't know, but it's serious. Think about it. How do we fail in rodent control? It's basically like this. Quit too soon. Don't take rodents seriously. Don't use enough traps. Lack of coordination and don't follow up. You'll fail. Do the opposite of all that and you'll be fine. I'm Stephen Van Tassel. Reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. Get some questions. I have a publication on the control of house mice and deer mice to summarize a lot of the material you've gotten here. Download it. It's your tax dollars at work. Definitely check it out. Thanks for your attention. All right. Thank you, Stephen. If you guys have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, we do have one comment. Uh, at Billings Clinic, there has been some C. diff and some patients. Ah, uh, yes, that's it's common around hospitals. Yes, but there might be other locations for that. Whether it's from mice or not, that would be another question. So we have there's a lot of uh, research in this area that just hasn't been done yet. Uh, so those are some challenges to be sure. Okay, we've got nothing else coming in. Um, reminder, if you didn't put your pesticide license number in the chat or in the Q&A at the beginning, uh, do so now so you can get your credits. Um, and we've got nothing else coming in. Give it a couple seconds here. Yeah, sometimes it takes a few minutes for people to type in. Yes. But we have a pretty small group today too, so there may not be any. Yeah. I actually have a question and it's kind sure. of a weird one. Um, but I know like with uh, livestock, if they get too overweight, then you have calving problems and lose calves. Does that happen okay. with mice? Uh, I, not that I'm aware of. Uh, so mice are pretty fertile. So a healthy, well-fed mouse actually will have larger litters and will carry more of those to term and more of them will mature. So this is why food. And so what people don't understand is that when you have healthy, well-fed mice, it just, it, it just magnifies their reproductive rate. And so that's why food stress is so important. But it also, food stress is important because it also makes your bait or trap more attractive to them, which is what we want to do as well. So think of it as that one, two punch. It's not just simply the jab, it's the right hook as well. So you want to have, you have to have both. And when people just simply rely on trapping or they just simply rely, they think they're going to poison their way to Shangri-La, they're missing the point. They're missing the long-term solution. And so a lot of times people will say, well, trapping doesn't work and they'll poison forever. And I'll say, well, it's poisoning is, you know, ask yourself, is poisoning working? Because you're poisoning forever and it, it's not working. And so to really get that long-term control, you've got to do the habitat modification and 
the lethal control as well. You can't do one without the other. Cool, thank you. Sure. Okay, with that, I have not seen anything come in. Um, so thank you, Stephen. Thank you all for Thanks, joining everybody. us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Have a great Thanksgiving, everybody.